Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 8th of March. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, pre-tremors of an Australian financial meltdown and cashless economy is a bail-in trap. Before we begin, I want to make this um, a, a sort of point for the, for the sake of the viewers. What we're going to re- be talking about on the show, Craig... Yeah. Um, is not just information for information's sake, right? We are, what we are revealing, what, and what we reveal on the CEC report, we reveal it because, one, it has to be defeated. We're fighting it. That's why we have to do this. And two, we can defeat it. And that's the most important thing. So to that end, regular viewers would um, be familiar. We need you to get involved in the, pro- the, the campaigns we have underway to take these issues on. So the rest of the show will elaborate on those issues. But we have financial, we have solutions to these financial problems besetting Australia. So specifically, right now, we have an, a Senate inquiry underway into the separation of banks bill, the Glass-Steagall breakup of the banks between normal banking that you and I do and the dangerous speculation that's going to bring down this financial system. Right? So the Royal Commission, the Royal Commission should have called for it, but the didn't. Royal Commission was it was was, was um, rigged, yeah. so it wasn't able to do that. Now we have a Senate inquiry. We need every single viewer, every single one, to make a submission to that. So what you need to do is um, get, put get to the uh, get on the website. We're putting up on the screen now. Get onto that. Call us if you need more help. Call our toll free number for for more advice on how to do it. But please make a submission. That's the first point. Second point is. We can't do justice fully to the topics of the time we have on this show. So if, you, if you're a first-time uh, caller, call in. If you want more information, call in and get a free copy of this publication. We elaborated in here, the Australian Alert Service. This is our weekly magazine. Call in and get that because that's how you will... And we have all the information there on how to get involved as well. So please do that. Do not think of this information as just information for information's sake. All right? Join the fight. So that end, let's get on to what the fight's actually about. Firstly pre-tremors of an Australian financial meltdown. And Craig, I, I found this big, this news this week. So the 5th of March, a few days ago, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, an obscure thing for some people, but not if you've been paying attention. Suncorp, one of the, not one of the major banks, but one of the, the second tier banks in Australia, Suncorp on the 5th of March announced a spike in arrears on, um, the, on borrowers' repayments on a mortgage bond that it sold in 2010, there's a spike in arrears of, 70, of 60 days plus up to 3%. Mm-hmm. So 3% of the borrowers whose bond payments, whose, bar, whose mortgage repayments service that bond uh, have jumped to 3% um, or there are 60 days in arrears or more. Yeah, yeah Robbie, right? so these bonds are made, they're basically called mortgage-backed securities. They're yeah. bundled up mortgages, thousands of them, I believe, very complicated instruments, actually, and they're yes. all bundled up together, and they're on sold, right? And the idea is that the uh, the, the, the the people pay the banks their mortgage, and that's they keep paying the on. bank, but the but bank doesn't. They don't actually owe the bank anymore. They owe these these bondholders. Yeah, when, right? when you raised this, Robbie, I went back and had a look at the uh, the, the Reserve Bank website because I want to find out where are the residential mortgage-backed securities at, and I was stunned that when you look at the graph of the actual mor- um, these these securities that are issued. It's really quite something because back in 1992, these things next started. And it was next to nothing, and yep. the value of mortgages was very low. Remember, much yep. much smaller. Look what happened coming into the global financial crisis. An absolute mountain of these things were issued. Yes, and and, it's, and that we've be, our, what you see there in that chart is how dependent our banking system has become on this mechanism. Yeah, right. So if there's any sort of fluctuation in the price of interest rates or the economy, which we're going to go through. You know, people defaulting on their mortgage, then this is going to have ramifications, major ramifications for liquidity of the banking well, system. Well, exactly, especially if you have any understanding of how the global financial crisis started back in two thousand, the, the two thousand eight crash started. The very first sign, Craig, that there was a problem hmm. was an, on the seven, on the eighth of February two thousand and seven. HSBC, the biggest British bank and one of the, the third biggest bank in the world it made a surprise announcement that it had made losses on um, its subprime mortgages, right? This, sort of, this announcement came out of the blue for people who, you know, for almost everybody. There was a few people, and we're going to play a clip in a minute, but the, the, the people in the movie The Big Short, that's, they, they knew this was coming, but 
for, for the rest of the, the financial community, this announcement by HSBC was a huge shock, mm. right? And of course, at the time they said, okay, we've, we've suffered this loss, but everything should be okay. That was the normal thing that they said. Well, of course it wasn't. But then the shocks kept coming after that and they, they culminated in the 2008 meltdown. So um, uh, what's, what, what Suncorp has announced is not a default on its bond yet, right? And the significance of this, of this, though, is no Australian mortgage bond, no mortgage-backed security in this chart has ever been defaulted on, Craig, ever, mm -hmm. right? So Suncorp hasn't announced a, def a default yet. What it's announced, though, is it ha because it hit this 3% threshold, where 3% of the borrowers are suddenly having trouble re meeting payments, then that triggers um, delays in the way the payments are doled out to the, to the, to the specific investors because they're invested in different levels of the bond. And I want to play this clip now, or a series of clips from the, from the movie The Big Short, and this is a famous scene which explains the complicated nature of these bond structures. Sorry. This is your basic mortgage bond. All right? The originals were simple. They were just thousands of AAA mortgages bundled together, guaranteed by the US government. The modern ones are different. They're private and they're made up of layers of tranches. The highest level AAA is getting paid first, the lowest rated B is getting paid last, taking on defaults first. Now obviously if you're buying Bs, you can make more money, but they're a little risky. Sometimes they fail. Chris? Somewhere along the line, these Bs and double Bs went from a little risky to dog shit. Where's the trash? I'm behind you. I'm talking rock bottom FICO scores. No income verification. Adjustable rates, dog shit. The default rates are already up from one to 4%, fellas. And if they rise to 8%, and they will, a lot of these triple Bs are going to zero too. And that, you're too close, is an opportunity. Okay, you're saying that at 8% the bonds fail and we are already at 4%? That's right. If they go to 8, it's Armageddon. Yeah, that's right. How come nobody's talking about this? How can these underlying bonds be as bad as you say? It wouldn't be legal. <clears throat> Nobody knows what's in them. Nobody knows what's in the bonds. I've seen some that are 65% AAA rated that I know for a fact are filled with 95% subprime shit with FICOs below 550. Get the fuck out of here. And they're going to zero. No, it can't be right. I mean, there, there were 500 billion in housing bonds sold last year alone. The ratings agencies, the banks, the fucking government, they're saying they're all asleep at the wheel? Yeah. My whole department's long on this stuff. They call me Chicken Little. They call me Bubble Boy. A's, zero. B's, zero. Double B's, zero. Triple B's, zero. And then that happens. What is that? That's America's housing market. Thank you. So the point there, Craig, is that these are not even just normal bonds. They're actually quite complicated instruments. Well, right. right? It requires nuclear physicists and very skilled mathematicians <laughs> right. to figure out how these things are going to go. No, that's right. So what's that? So the Fin Review, the Financial Review, the, the day the day this announcement was made, rushed out an article saying, "No, no, there's no, there's nothing concerning here, right?" And as far as I'm concerned, for the Financial uh -oh. Review to say it, it proves it, right? Oh, head for the exits. But banking analysts that I've spoken to said, "No, this is a real area of concern." So we're going to, let's have a quick break and we'll continue this after the break. Welcome back to the CEC Report. We were discussing pre-tremors of an Australian financial meltdown. And before the, the break, Craig, we talked about this announcement by Suncorp that a mortgage bond it sold in 2010 is starting to get in a little bit of trouble, right? Because 3% of the borrowers who service, whose repayments service that bond are now in arrears. Can I make the point, Robbie? We just had a Royal Commission. And look at how these mortgages were sold in the last 10 years. Yes. Well, that's right. good. I'm glad you said that because that's I want to get into that. Okay, right? good. Hold, just hold your fire for a second because I want to make the point before we do that. The timing, the most curious thing about this particular thing is this is a bond from 2010. 
So this is a this is this was these were mortgages sold issued in 2010 to borrowers then, bundled up and sold as this bond, and that means those borrowers have been remaking their payments for a decade. Mm -hmm. They've been fined for a decade. Suddenly, they're in trouble. Yeah. Right now, why the spike in arrears? Um, it coincides with a few things. There's a, the plunging house prices underway now, right? And one of the things the plunging house prices have done is stop refinancing options, right? For a lot of people are trapped. They're trapped in negative equity. They're trapped in, in this, um, this no man's land, this limbo where they can't refinance their loan. And refinancing has been huge for mortgages for a long time, right? So, so it's coincided with that. It's coincided with slower economic growth, and all the economists are flapping their arms today. Oh, no, the growth is slowing down. The IMF, the, the, sorry, the Reserve Bank has to cut rates. It's also coincided with other key signs that th this one was called this week. They reported there's been a, um, a steep fall in new car sales. The steepest has been in Melbourne and Sydney, down 11% February this year compared to February last year. And people have called, the, the experts have called that a canary in the car yard, right? So all mm -hmm. these signs that there's real brewing economic pro problems out there. And therefore... That's, that means that people are not using their mortgages to buy new cars. Exactly. This, this mortgage debt has been fueling the economy. So what does it mean, though, for more recent borrowers? And that, that goes to the point you just made. Mm. Um, the, the, we know a few things. 20, from 2012 to 2016, um, there was a massive spike in interest-only borrowing. Now, in, in Australian interest-only borrowing sort of has, has averaged around 30% of all, of all um, mortgages mm -hmm. uh, in average. But for 2012 to 2016, it spiked up to about 50%, right? This was, this was huge. These were people, why they do interest only? Because they couldn't afford a normal mortgage, right? So a massive spike in those. Um, we also know from the Royal Commission and from the work of Denise Braley of the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association, assisted by the people like Lindsay David and Philip Seuss of LF Economics, that a huge amount of that lending was based on outright fraud. Yeah, the Henderson right. Poverty Index and so forth. They just pretended these yeah. people didn't have these the normal housing expenses, yep. right? The yeah. normal cost of living in expenses. In some cases, it was zero. <laughs> That's right. In some cases, it was zero. Um, Denise makes the point, Denise Braley, who's a real expert on this because she's she's done more work with the victims than anybody, she, she accuses the banks that when they do the securitisation, Craig, what they're securitising is their crap. Yeah. These, these crap mortgages, right? Yep. Um, but she... Rev but So the question is... If they've securitised their crap mortgages, why aren't some of these more recent um, issues of mortgages based on these much bigger values, right? The, the, yeah. the size of the loans in 2010 were half what they've been making the last few years, right? Why aren't they in default yet? Well, this is Denise's, what Denise revealed to us and in her submission to the Royal Commission um, from last year is that the banks go out of their way for the, at least the first five years when they, when they know they've lent money to people who can't afford to pay it back. They, they have these tricks so that they ensure those people at least make their payments for a while. They include all these extra buffers, right? One is they'll loan them more than the house is worth, right? So they, they have that extra loan money to, to, to help meet the repayments. They give them twenty-five dollars to $100,000 credit cards as well. And the credit card is, they, they quickly start having to tap into that to meet the loan repayments. They'll give them lines of credit They'll give them top-ups to those lines of credit, right? And this is the most mind-blowing to me. The average debt for the average borrower, because of this, increases in that first five years by $150,000, right? So what they've borrowed to buy the house, five years later, on average, they're $150,000 more in debt because that's the extra credit the banks have given them to make it look like they're paying them payments. And these are full recourse loans, Robbie, exactly. which is really important because Australians... You know, they, they go without food in order to be able to pay these mortgages. So this is a form of absolute debt slavery because of this, you know, addiction to effectively gambling is what it is. Yeah, as you and, saw and, in it's, and, it's, and it's the banks, the point of the, the addiction yeah. is from the banks. Yes. Right? This is their way. They've, they've, built, they've built a whole business model around making money out of this. Um, Speculation. We're at a point where the banks can't, Keep that up, right? Because especially, especially now with property prices falling, Craig. Because what property price? Well, property prices are going up. There's a risk calculation that they think think ultimately that's the buffer. If everything goes bad, we can sell the property and get our money back. When property prices fall, 
the risk calculation changes for everybody. It changes for the banks, it changes for the property investors, they can't justify buying, and it changes for the normal house, the normal borrowers, normal people, because they, they start thinking, well, man, property prices are coming down, I'll have to buy a house, but if I hold off a year, I might be able to get something better for less, right? Mm -hmm. Changes everything, and this is, this is the problems you're starting to see. Everyone is paying attention to this now, and they're starting to head toward the exit. So I just wanted to highlight this. Um, yesterday, on the, uh, the, the 7th of March, economist John Adams revealed on Twitter, and I'll put his tweet up on the, scr on the screen, JP Morgan, the giant American bank, one of the biggest banks in the world, has, is holding a conference here in Melbourne right now, right? And they've flown in their real estate experts from around the world to this conference, and they are telling their clients, get out of Australian real estate. And to give people a sense of how significant that it is, um, the, back in 2017, the United States Studies Center produced a report called uh, Indispensable Economic Partners, the US-Australia Investment Relationship, which emphasized just how much Australia's banking system depends on US capital. And it said, quote, US capital markets, especially debt markets, are a vital source of capital for Australian companies especially the banking and financial services sector. The big four banks are heavily reliant on wholesale funding from US debt markets. Due to foreign exchange markets, the depth of US debt markets and interest rate derivatives, the United States is the overwhelming source of that funding. So if JP Morgan is telling the American investors, get out of Australian real estate, right? Time's nearly up. Well, you can also, Robbie, that's a real warning for people. Why this is going to be a driver for the collapse of housing prices? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, we've been when the money dries up, it dries there's up. There's been forecasts of some people being radically, radically saying, I say radically because it's not really that radical when you look at all the parameters of housing for prices falling by at least fifty, up to fifty percent. Well, Craig, I was going to play a clip. We don't have time, but I want to give it a plug. So, um, it, some viewers might be familiar. Um, if you get on YouTube, go to the Walk the World channel, which is hosted by Martin North of Digital Finance Analytics. It's called Walk the World. And on the 2nd of March, he posted an interview with a, an Irish financial writer and broadcaster, Eddie Hobbs, who's been looking at Australia's situation from the standpoint of what Ireland experienced a decade ago, and it is chilling. And he goes through the scale of Irish, Ireland's collapse, and you can see that, if, that they had 50 to 80% falls, right? And that can easily happen here. Watch this for just for a reality check. But but um, my question for you, Craig, this is reality. It's not abstract economic scenarios that we're talking about. How important is it to put in place solutions now to preempt what we're well, You don't about? want chaos, Robbie. That's what we're moving into. You know, panic amongst ordinary people. That And look, the banks aren't going to step in and self-regulate themselves. No. That's why we've got a bill in Parliament right now, it's introduced by Pauline Hanson in the Senate, to separate the banks from their normal commercial banking operation. We need banks to support the economy, but they must be regulated and then you have to, you, because you have to uh, separate them away from this gambling. Yeah. I mean, this is merchant they investment. They shouldn't be allowed bank. to do this. No. So what you've got, you know, the reason this has happened is because over the last 20 plus years, 30 years, banks have, ac have, ac have had access to people's deposits. They've been allowed to speculate. They've been able to get into this really speculative activity and make huge profits from it. So our bank bill in this, our bank bill in the um, in, in the separation bill in the Senate, what that does is separates out and quarantines the necessary banking, um, uh, you know, functions. Part, yeah, function we need for the economy. The rest of it can go to hell. Yeah, forget it. I mean, it's all gambling. And, and at some point, it's going to have to be a write down of all the debts and crap that's in the system. Well, on that. But you've got to preserve the physical economy, which means we've got a, you know, a multiple. We have platform, a five point program. Yeah, a five point program for this, which is Glass Steagall, first and foremost, create a sane banking system, a yep. stable, regulated banking system. Then we have to emit large amounts of credit, so we need a national bank to monitor the private banking system, to control the private banking system, and that credit has to be emitted into large-scale infrastructure development projects in collaboration with some of our regional partners like China and the One Belt, One Road Initiative. And just because we're running out of time, can I interrupt? The foreclosure moratorium is also incredibly important. That's, yeah, absolutely. Because, look, 
You've got people that have taken out mortgages on vastly expensive homes. You can't have a social crisis where people are thrown out of their homes. You just can't have it, otherwise you lose the country. Yeah, so we, have, we are anticipating all those problems. We've got solutions for them. Get involved in the fight with us. Let's take a quick break. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, cashless economy is a bail-in trap. Now, last week, Craig, on the show, you and Elisa revealed this IMF demand. The IMF has released it. This February report demands quite extraordinarily that, it, that the, the bail-in law that was passed a year ago isn't enough, which we call sort of a, an ad hoc bail-in by the back door. That's not enough. Australia has to go to full statutory bail-in, which can explicitly grab deposits. The IMF demanded that. And further, the IMF demanded that these, what we call the democratic safeguards over the bank regulator, APRA, which means that the, the, the treasurer who we elect can tell it what to do, and the parliament that we elect can disallow its actions if they want to, if they deem it necessary, the IMF is demanding that they all be scrapped. So there's no democratic safeguards over APRA. So that if APRA gets an order from the Bank for International Settlements to bail in our banks and ruin all your lives, a politician listening to you, the people who vote him in, cannot organise an insurrection in Parliament to stop it. That's right. Right? It's gun that's, that's what the IMF demanded. Robbie, people should go back to our website. For six years, since 2013, we've been warning of exactly yes. this. We've got all the documentation. We've written about it. We've shown the historical precedents for this, that we're, you know, the Financial Stability Board, based in the Bank of International Settlements, over in Switzerland there, has been dictating a policy of financial stability in order to to do exactly what And happened. the Australian authorities have tried to keep it on the down low, and yes. then the IMF comes out and just lays bare the whole agenda, right? Now, we have to defeat that, and again, our bill in Parliament will stop it. Our bill in Parliament, the one that Craig talked about before the break, the Glass-Steagall bill, separation of banks, the biggest section is on APRA, yes. and it brings it under tighter parliamentary control, yes. so this kind of thing can't happen. However, what I want to highlight here, we have an article in this week's issue of the Australian Alert Service, Craig, the war on cash leaves no place to hide from bail-in. And it draws on the work of economist uh, John Adams, who's a very outspoken, courageous economist who has been blowing the whistle on a lot of the, the, the bad developments in the Australian economy. Um, uh, on, you, can, you can see the full, his full article on his website, adamseconomics.com, and uh, it's called The New Global Push for Negative Nominal Interest Rates. And he's highlighting the crackdown on cash, people being able to use cash around the world. France has legally prohibited cash transactions above 1,000 euros, Spain above 2,500 2, euros, Italy above 3,000 euros. The European Central Bank has ish ended the production of its 500 euro note. The government of India last year eliminated 86%, oh, sorry, in 2016, 86% of all physical cash, and that was a huge backlash to that. Sweden is 95% cashless. Vietnam has a plan to become 90% cashless by 2020. Australia has joined what John Adams calls the war on cash because last year's budget, Scott Morrison announced that cash transactions over $10,000 will be made illegal. Initially, it was as of July this year, but now it'll be as of January 2020, next year. Um, but Craig, the thing, John's point is that policies like negative nominal interest rates, which is crazy, and also our point is bail-in, what these policies do then, because they're so nuts, they're designed to prop up the system, they, people react to them and do things like pull their money out of the bank and keep it in cash. Isn't this kind of, it, where we're going, isn't this a form of fascism to, to take the freedoms of people away to prop up you've the already, system? You've taught to define it, Robbie. Negative interest is where you've got to pay the bank in order to put your money into yeah. it, whether it's cash or not. right? And look, you're talking about paying a tradesman you know, more than $10,000 in cash is no longer allowed. So people, this is a complete, you know, uh, well, it's just fascism. That's it is. what it is. That's what fascinates me. You take the your, corporate. The people lose their freedom, right? So a corporate structure can be maintained. That's, that's what right. that was actually what the definition of fascism is, yeah, right? Exactly. A police state for a corporatocracy. All right. Well, look for more information in our Australian Alert Service. Craig, we're running out of time. Thanks for your input yeah, today. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks for, to the viewer. Tune in next week for more. Mm -hmm.